Okay, we're back. We're back. Hey. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, Eric, how do you get how do you get a hold of the Leadly group? I didn't see anything there, you know, like a phone number or an ad or or a website. Yeah, it's it's easy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. All right. Uh it's a link is in the description of where you're actually uh watching from. So they could just go to the link and click on there. Gotcha. All right. Well, thank you. I knew you'd clarify that because I had no clue. Um, hey, when we before we went to that break, I'd thrown out a question about this civil war. Um, what role did the Farm Bill in 2018 have by, quote unquote, legalizing 0.3 percent uh, cannabis sativa, calling it hemp? And and the human element gets involved in a loophole and is able to spin it. So now they have products that are basically hot hemp that can get you high that are available in convenience stores and gas stations. And now the, that group, the hemp industry, if you will, is not necessarily fighting with the cannabis industry. However, the cannabis industry isn't really thrilled that non-licensed, non-tested products are in the market that they're trying to get into. Um, Sean, I'm sure you have an opinion about this. Are we in the middle of a civil war or is this exactly what the government wanted to do, um, which was pit both sides of the same plant against each other? Yeah, the conflict between a federal uh, model and the state models. And you see places like California where they outlawed hemp anywhere outside the legal cannabis dispensaries because of the competitive disadvantage. Yeah, I mean, we definitely have a fight, right? Um, the state license holders want to ban it or control it. Uh, they don't like the fact that have a competitive, because it's, it's regulated like agriculture. It's a hell of a lot cheaper than being regulated like a cannabis business in these states, right? With the extreme cost. And so the, the, the few things I just want to touch upon about the farm bill is how beneficial it was to patients and people who use it, especially in states that there is no access, Texas, et cetera. Uh, I think about it, Texas, I went back after having, I'm, a, I'm one of those felonious possession guys uh, in 2015. Uh, and uh, I, it involved Texas, I'll leave it at that. And I went back two years ago and got to smoke in the open. Why? Because they can't differentiate between hemp and, and cannabis. And the cops have given up trying to, right? And all these veterans who were having to pay way too much in the illicit market for cannabis are at least able to access marijuana light, call it whatever you want to call it. Like you said, hot hemp. Um, it's better than nothing. And so it's had a tremendous beneficial decriminalization aspect on a federal level because of the difficulty you have to test it. And most of these police departments don't have the ability to test it like that. So they stopped harassing a lot of, in a lot of places. So that's a beneficial, but no doubt. I mean, I've been in a couple of board meetings or on some board meetings with cannabis companies and their, their marching orders is when you can substitute hemp for cannabis, even with D8 or whatever, we want to do that on our supply chain. So that should tell you all you need to know. There you go. Hirsch, what's your feeling about this uh, division between the two? Yeah, you know, I, I, I first I just want to echo a lot of what Sean said. I think Sean um, is making a good point about access, right? I think even critics of the quote unquote hemp industry have to acknowledge that it is more accessible, right? Sometimes than regulated industries and can be more affordable for veterans. And also, you know, again, even critics will have to acknowledge that it's had a normalizing effect, right? Because it is legal and prevents cops from 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 doing that. So I think those are both good points that Sean made. I'll just make the other, again, maybe obvious point that this legal distinction doesn't really make sense, right? Obviously, it's just one plant, the cannabis plant. And, uh, you know, the, the the legal distinction the 2018 Farm Bill made between what it defines as marijuana and what it defines as, as cannabis and the fact that one is legal and the other is federally legal, that obviously makes no sense. And so that has to be reconciled at, at some point. Um, yeah. And, and, and Mark, I'm going to get to you and I'm going to throw this out as a factoid that happened actually today, a news item that the U.S. Cannabis Council, a lobbying group for the MSOs in Washington, D.C., has rejected uh, hemp leaders from joining their board. So are we in the middle of a civil war here, Mark? We have been for quite some time. I mean, for as long as I've been in cannabis, there's been that, that division between uh, hemp and and. Uh, Real cannabis, I don't know how you put it. I mean, 15 years ago, it was all called hemp, okay? Now, all of a sudden, now we cannabis is different than marijuana, which is different. It's it's so ridiculous in so many different ways. 
Delta Eight is a chemistry project. Yeah, right. I look at that as a consolation prize. That's all, a consolation prize. It's not what we want. It's not where we should be. It's not where we should be going for. If we want legalization in this country, I can tell you right now, we have 16 states in this country that can do a direct initiative now, right now. Now that's going to change. With each each election, that gets smaller. That's going to get smaller and smaller. Uh, there are interests within, there are, there are, are uh, politicians right now that are working very diligently to eliminate our ability to self-govern through through the initiative process, but that is how major any any major law when it, go, it goes to comes to cannabis, there is where we've made those changes. All we need is one state that truly legalizes. But I wish we could get at least three or four. I could tell you which states those would be. They would be the ones that, that where you could gather the least number of signatures. Because if we put real legalization on any ballot throughout this country it will pass. I know that for and a it, fact. You can argue about it all you want, but I know it would happen. And it and it is the one item on all in all elections that increases the voter turnout, which is fascinating to me and, and to itself, um, that people still don't. I, I mean, I've, I've talked to at least a half dozen people who said, oh, I'm not going to vote. It's not going to matter. I'm like, ah, I mean, that just kills me as, a, as an American because it is the right that, that um, our veterans have, have fought for for years, the, the, the freedom to vote and have your own time where you get to pick the candidates that you want to represent you or at least stay in office uh, longer than they should. Oh, sorry. Did I go there? Um, Hirsch, um, what's your feeling now about the future? Should we have one regulatory body that that regulates both the synthetic or artificial or Delta eight world and the Delta nine cannabis license tested world? That's a, that's a good question. You know, I don't know if I, I have a, a really strong um, opinion on that. I think what you're likely to see is a different approach, right or wrong. You're likely to see a different approach state by state. I think each state is, is kind of, you know, Jimmy asking is asking itself the question that you're asking, do we have the same body do this or do we have different, different bodies? And I think that depends on whether that state, like Sean was making a good point earlier about how California has taken a really restrictive approach towards hemp. And there are some adult use states that have done that. And so, I don't know if I, I if I have the genius answer on that one, but I think, fortunately or unfortunately, we're likely to see a, a bifurcated state by state approach on which agencies are are regulating which industries, which again will add to the chaos and the confusion. I think in these states, unfortunately. Yeah, isn't it an agricultural product, uh, Sean? I mean, it, yeah, you, can uh, grow, is, you can grow this stuff, right? Yeah, hemp is considered agriculture. It's treated like agriculture. And I think what, you know, Hirsch is talking about this weave of different ways we're dealing with it is part of parcel of the problem, how we've legalized it. And I think that matters. Mark's touched on it very well. Um, I don't think we've legalized it necessarily the best way, but, you know, bottom line, it's brought freedom. So I'm not going to knock it too much. But I think we have a lot more to go because of things Mark and Hirsch both just highlighted. Yeah. Eric, um, it's your turn. <laughs> I'll let you go ahead and ask a question for the panel. Go ahead. I, I, I'm i sure you could come up with something. I know you will. <laughs> well, Hirsch, uh, this is directed to you. You know, when you, you see how we work with each other in inside the industry, you know, peer to peer, it's always a licensing issue. Like, I don't want to talk to you. Where does the newcomer in the industry get to, you know, where, where's the roadmap for the newcomer? Hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I will say this. I, I I am constantly seeing an influx of new people into cannabis. And I think a lot of times you see that in new states that, that are opening up, to be honest with you. And as I think the industry gets bigger, there's opportunity for more people. And as cannabis gets destigmatized, there is um, more of a willingness for people to participate in the industry. So it's kind of a catch-22 in that at least I think cannabis is so complex that I've seen a lot of people come in from other industries, right? And and like, especially you see these high-flying executives come in from other spaces and they come into cannabis and they can't really get their bearings. So I guess I am a believer, you know, as someone who's been in this for like seven years now, which by some standards is a long time, by some standards is not a long time, right? It just shows you some people have been in this game for 25 years, right? But oh, I yeah. guess, you know, 
Um, I, for, 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 for me, it's, it's like, you know, it's been a learning curve. Um, and, um, and I'm learning more every day. So I, I know that's not a great answer, but I, I am heartened. Like I'm, I'm here in Missouri, right? And I think there's a bunch of people who are working in cannabis today in Missouri who weren't working in cannabis a couple of years ago. And that's a good thing, right? And, and I think we'll continue to see that going forward. Yeah. Excellent. Mark's, in, Mark's in Missouri too. Um, right, Mark? Um, yes. uh, but you're not, I know you're not attending MJ Unpack because we talked about that earlier. But um, so where, where do we go? Where do we go from here, Mark? Let me let me ask you that question. What do you think the future looks like? And I'm going to guess that it has something to do with the results of uh, this election that we may not know for a week or two. This election is going to determine a lot. I mean, I already like last week I was here in advance uh, trying to make connections with cannabis, saying that fentanyl was being laced with cannabis. Uh, you know, that's. A huge issue. There's more fear, more fear, and we don't need that. And it kind of tells you that it's going to be a very unstable situation if we go that direction. I'm afraid. Uh, going the other direction with uh, with Harris, well, uh, there is more act. Uh, uh, Harris was very much involved with the More Act. The More Act has major problems as well, and everybody, including Normal, is raving about the More Act. Well, the More Act will bring federal uh, oversight. It's going to bring additional uh, reg, uh, regulation on the states. It's going to mean it's going to mean a federal uh, excise tax that's going to be on top of the excise taxes that people are already dealing with within their states. It's a mess. We don't want the feds involved in this. It's not real legalization. It's just more of the same, and we don't need more of the same. Unfortunately, I'm still at that point where I believe that this is a we're going to win this battle on state by state. I don't see any other way. Uh, you cannot do what we can do in a state. You can't do that on a federal basis. And you're dealing with a lot of very corrupt people on, on right. a federal level. Yeah. So. At, at every level, humans, I, it, you know, it goes back to what Sean said about money. It really can be the root of all evil and people just do the grab, grab, grab. I'm going to get in this cannabis space. I'm going to make a lot of money. It doesn't work like that, does it? it and I have yet to talk to anybody who's made a ton of money in weed. Well, understand, sir. I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt here, but Go just ahead. understand that that uh, when you're when you're dealing with a direct initiative, you bypass the lawmakers, you even bypass the governor of the of the state to bring an issue directly to the people. And then the people decide to put it on the ballot. The only problem we have there is the secretary of the state has the right to write the summary for that. And there become, there's the, the problem. And well, they look, can manipulate that summary to say whatever they want. We're just trying to get the questions agreed. And, and, and the, look what happened in Arkansas, people. I mean, I know you all have been following the news that Arkansas had this uh, voter initiative to expand their medical program. They were to go out and collect 80,000 signatures. And then they changed the rules and made it 120,000. They got there. And then the Secretary of State said, came in and said, OK, these signatures aren't any good. And then uh, I think there was another, another move that got that question back on the ballot. And then finally, the Supreme Court of um, Arkansas basically said, well, even though the question's on the ballot, we're not going to count those votes. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, my goodness gracious. And what can you do? What can we do? I mean, uh, Sean, I know you have great ideas on this type of thing. How how are things going to change to a positive to get to the point where I want normalization and acceptance, not necessarily legalization? Right. I mean, the, the truth is, many cases, the health component of this there's a lot of people who don't want that you know restricting advertising restricting billboards look at meta they don't want to normalize cannabis at all i mean we have a weed for Warrior, our weed for warriors project meta deleted both of them we had huge followings not only educating but putting resources in veterans hands only about the veterans you know the, dis the suicide overdose epidemic and cannabis and they deleted it right we weren't selling anything we weren't doing anything like that it's hard to normalize it when you have a huge, and, and I hate to say this, I go back to the anti-smoking. There's a lot of NGOs out there, and I use that word loosely in terms of any of these foundations. Or, or there. They are spending a lot of money. I don't know if you just saw, Hearst, the Public Health Institute, and what they dropped as suggestions for California's uh, cannabis program. 
every, and it's a doctor, it's a group of, you know, scientists and doctors who are prohibitionist men. They are the, if you wanted to take Prop 64 off life support and absolutely kill the recreational adult use market in California and follow their advice, right? We've got to normalize this. You've got to just put freedom and liberty that two consensual adults have the right to both give, take, and partake in cannabis. And at some point, we need to just talk about what this is about. It's about freedom and everything that Mark talked about, from the Moore Act to the CAOA, uh, Mark, you talked about, is not about giving us freedom to do much other than try to pay a lot of taxes to mm -hmm. enjoy consuming what effectively is a weed. And it's not going to work because all you're going to do is have, once you decriminalize possession effectively with these legal adult markets and you try to restrict supply with limited licensing, guess what happens? economically it just blows up the illicit market and you're seeing that big time on the west coast and i think it's going to eat itself into all these legal markets for most of them because there's no way they can compete on a what's an ounce cost me so we are getting a lot of questions from um on our interactive chat board uh from some of our uh, cannabis coast to coast correspondents i've noticed the virginia cannabis my man joe and virginia it right there Removing He's doing a great job. All together. Bingo. He just nailed it. What's that? Virginia Cannabis Connection said it has to be removed from the CSA, Controlled Substance Act, altogether. That Entirely. is the problem, the Controlled Substance Act. And that's a lot. It's a problem for a lot of things beyond cannabis, but let's just stick there. Right. Well, by the way, that was Richard Nixon who continues to haunt me. Um, he haunted me as a, as a 10, 12, 13, 14 year old, I'm pretty sure. And, uh, and it's still here. Shouldn't the CSA be rewritten at this point because we know so much more about different drugs and uh, uh, Jimmy, this big is pharma not going to let us do that right who's going to get to rewrite it big pharma it's not going to change they love it it's working for them that's why when our government is not looking like it's getting anything done it's because it's working for the people with the money and big pharma has the most i talked to a friend of mine who's a yeah. uh, a licensed vertical in massachusetts and he's scared uh that uh, as if it gets legalized or even moved to, to Schedule 3, Big Pharma is going to control it and it's going to put them all out of business. That's not really? good for the economy. The Big Pharma doesn't need any more money, right? And we have mostly craft people, small craft growers are going to get forced out. That's, that, it's an opportunity here to do the right thing, right? But can we do that? It, How it, those, yeah, We have government by the few for the fewer at the expense of all us it is 100% about the Supreme Court decision, which made speech money, corporations, people. We are, we have lost our democracy, our republic, however you want to describe it, because yep. at the end of the day, the billionaires matter. We don't. Yeah. Go ahead, well Hirsch. Put. Hirsch, you, you going to chime in there? Yeah, I mean, I, I was just going to say, Jimmy, what you were saying earlier about Arkansas. I mean, yeah. I think that's really important to highlight. A similar thing is happening in Nebraska. So Nebraska yep. has a medical cannabis initiative. They're trying yep. to invalidate that as well, even though it got the right amount of, of signatures. So it, they are, they, a judge okayed it today. You know, I, I did see that basically the judge okayed the counting of the votes, but there still could be potential <laughs> legal challenges to the votes after the fact. Of so, course there are. It's it's absurd. And look, I think maybe we all know this, people who are watching, but this is a pattern, right? So when Mississippi passed their medical initiative, right, on um, the Supreme Court invalidated after the fact, South Dakota, when they passed their adult use initiative in 2020. So this is a, a pattern where uh, the courts are being used to um, impede the will of the people on this issue. And it's undemocratic and it shouldn't be able to stand. And we need to raise the visibility of this blatantly undemocratic pattern of behavior. Yeah, there's a there's a movement out there, the deschedule, not reschedule movement. Uh, anybody have any insight on that, Mark or or or, or Sean? Yeah. Go ahead. An interesting, an interesting an interesting point about this is is that is the uh, desensitization of the Schedule One, right? And this is one of the things that the Moore Act does actually taking and saying, well, we'll take it off the drug schedule, but we'll still retain all the same restrictions that we had as a Schedule One. It's a very dangerous thing to do, particularly when you're looking at all the other things that are Schedule One that are out there, and and suddenly realizing that if you know if cannabis is removed from the drug schedule, it is basically a food as what it should have been all along. It is a food. Well, if you can take and put the restrictions that you put on a Schedule One drug on a food, you can put them on any food. Right. That's a very dangerous place to be. 
Right. Can we agree that it's a plant medicine? Yes. Okay, good. I just want to make sure that happens. That, <laughs> I've, that's exactly I have how I a, I've been working with people with cancer in, <laughs> for quite some time in that regard. Tell us a little bit about what you do, Mark, because the stories you have are pretty powerful. Well, I, I've collected stories over the last, uh, what, 18, 18, 19 years. And you know, at one point, I had over 230 stories on, on YouTube of patients that I interviewed all across the country. I've interviewed people with every illness there is. And uh, during my seven years in Colorado, uh, I started making cannabis oil just so that I would know how to make it. And then I was inundated with patients. All of a sudden, I never advertised, never wanted to make cannabis oil for anyone. But I was barraged with all these people who were poor, who had children who were dying, and they were on hospice, and they needed help. So I, I helped them, and uh, uh, they just kept coming and from every part of the country. And the thing, the reason was is because it does work. It does work. I stopped pediatric seizures in three minutes in my living room. I know it works. It doesn't work for every form of seizure, and I know that. Oh, but, you right. know, the fact is, is that it does work. I've seen it work, and I guess we have to show that to every American. This, one, this is what brings us back to education. We can educate this country if we just spend the time to do it. If we want to change the law in this country, we first have to bring education. We have to bring the education, the real education, not, oh, this gets you high, and this one here will get you even higher. No. What we need is real education and understanding that this is truly medicine and can truly benefit everyone on this planet. We can demonstrate that for people if we just have that opportunity. That's fantastic. That's great way. Great way to kind of. Does somebody else want to jump in? I was just going to say, Gorski yeah. brings up a good point in your your comment session. Since we're folks, that says move away from the word medicine and you won't have to worry about such restrictions. I agree 100 percent with what Mark said, but one of the issues here is. Who gets to define what is medicine? And that's the FDA's purview. And Pharma wants it that way, right? Because they don't want a competitive or substitutable project. So that's an interesting conundrum that's going to have to be reconciled because to be called medicine, just legally, we're going to have to stay within the FDA and define it that way. Or we're going to have to take it out and call it something else. I don't know if it's nutraceutical or what the hell we want to call it. But part of the problem here is we've given the FDA authority and a small oligo oligopoly, the f big pharma, control over what's called medicine. Yeah. I, I got to tell you. Understand, they, excuse me. Yeah. understand Hippocrates said, let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. Hmm. He's smarter than me, so I'll let him say. <laughs> <laughs> First he's going, yeah. Yeah, I like that too. Um, hey, look, we're up against it again, guys. I, first of all, I mean, we could go for hours with this group talking. I mean, it, it, it's at a level that I really... Um, it gets me Jones, as I used to say. Um, I, I really do enjoy it. And um, we've had some great comments from our comment board, which is the first time we've ever done anything live with the comment board uh, that I can actually read and see that isn't this big, you know, and it's uh, 15 feet away from me. So, Eric, uh, you did a hell of a job on that. And um, I really appreciate that. But I'd like to one of the things we're instituting and Mark, you, you mentioned this. Everyone has everyone who understands the plant and has any history with the plant has a story. And one of the things we're gonna be bringing to market is we're going to encourage the public to tell us what is your cannabis story? Come out of the cannabis closet, admit that you've used it in some capacity and what role has it played in your life? Um, one, of our, one of our comments was from um, one of our reporters and uh, he has epilepsy and he uses it every day because it controls his seizures. Another one of our reporters on Cannabis Coast to Coast News has a son who's autistic and she has to drive to school every day, take him out of school a thousand feet, give him his medicine and drive him back because no one in the school can administer those medicines. It's against the law in a legal state of Michigan. There's so many elements that this touches. So what I'd like to know uh, as we go right through it, and Eric, you get to answer this one too. Um, what is your cannabis story? My, mine is I started at age 14 and and because I was ADHD, I know you're shocked to hear this, um, and it helped me focus, hyper-focus, and it got me through school, got me into Tufts University, got me uh, uh, the ability to graduate, um, and I got a break that I became a sportscaster. And at age 30, when my son was born, I stopped everything for 10 years. And then 
as soon as that <clears throat> marriage ended, I uh, picked it right back up again with a guy who had taken me in, a friend who had said, anytime I'm at that end, go to it. So cannabis as a medicine has always been part of my life. In 2013, when Massachusetts uh, passed it and started its own medicinal program, I got my card in the first day because all I had to do was show them my hands. You guys see how gross they are. They're all arthritic fingers and I have it throughout my body. And now I've had five surgeries, five major surgeries in 25 years. I'm working on trying to heal from within. Cannabis is part of that. I don't do it until it, at night when I start to feel my pain again. Um, but that's my personal cannabis story. Um, Hirsch, if you'd like to share, if, if nobody wants to share, that's okay too. But I think a lot of people need to hear that, hey, look, you've been successful and you actually have used this product for a number of years. So Hirsch, if you don't mind, uh, would you share that with us? Yeah, mine is running. I, I love to run and cannabis helped me fall in love with running, which is my favorite form of exercise. We're learning more and more about how uh, cannabis actually activates the same uh, parts of yep. the endocannabinoid system as running. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was in St. Louis today and went on a long, beautiful run after consuming some cannabis that cleared my head and made me feel amazing. And, you know, it really integrates me and those things integrate well with one another. So I could give you a million stories about how cannabis has enhanced my life, but that's if you ask for one and that's one. <laughs> That's great. Um, Sean, go ahead. I'll say what my uh, my kids, four kids said to uh, Sanjay Gupta, seen him with two, uh, three when we did that. Um, cannabis gave me my dad back. And I hear that all the time with our chapters and our kids. It's, it really gives uh, these vets their humanity back and allows them to connect with people, personal friends and family. And so that's what we hear all the time. It's saving lives. And, and that's the stories that why we're fighting for this. There you go. Eric, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you put me on the spot. It's okay. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's straightforward. Uh, I was in a relationship and they were like, you got to try this. You got to try this. And I was like, no, no, no. I'm a, I'm a hippie of the 80s, you know, where it was like, <laughs> wait, wait, no, wait, 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 no. wait, 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 hang on a second. The hippies were in the 60s. Okay. They <laughs> no. were in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> but there were some remnants of that in the okay. 80s. Okay. <laughs> Hippie wannabes. I get it. Yes. Go ahead. Wannabes. I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, I was not forced, but it was like, try it. And I said, okay. And it was a bong. And I said, wow, I feel really <laughs> good. <laughs> and I found myself socially drinking less afterwards. Okay. I felt more chill, relaxed. Uh, I always have that rule, you know, I, I'm not driving afterwards per se until I'm like really down. But, uh, you know, I came into the industry. I was recruited in the industry and then just went woo right off. So thanks, Jimmy. Sure. No problem. Uh, Mark, um, I, I know your story and I'd love to hear that one again. It's uh, it's very compelling. Oh, well, it's just, I, I first started using cannabis when I was 16 something like that, 15, 15, I guess it was when I got my yeah. first, first joint that mm -hmm. I tried, you know, and it was like four years later, it was the first patient I actually worked with. And, and uh, it was a, a good friend of mine who was dying of uh, testicular cancer. And I provided him with his cannabis. Didn't even realize all I knew back then was that it could maybe help him with the pain he was dealing with. I had no idea that it could actually help to eradicate cancer as well. But uh, I was, uh, my diagnosis was, uh, See, it was in 97, I guess it was. I was uh, diagnosed with severe uh, fibro, uh, with fibromyalgia pain with severe migraines. And what cannabis did for me was it took away my migraines, which was huge. Understand that at one point I lost my center vision because of the migraines. I couldn't work. I couldn't do anything. And I was a, I was a certified welder and pipe fitter. But you can't do that kind of work if, if you've got a, a blinding migraines. But uh, yes, yeah, so over the course of uh, several years, as I was exposed to better and better quality cannabis, but uh, uh, what took away my migraines initially was very poor quality cannabis, which t spoke tremendously to me. So yeah, that's, the re that's what brought me into cannabis and got me started. And then it was real realization that I was a middle-aged man living in Missouri and I desperately needed cannabis to be able to live. What was I going to do? You know, middle-aged man trying to trying to buy cannabis. At one point, I literally was buying cannabis from a guy uh, up in downtown St. Louis out of his trunk of his car. Very poor oh. quality cannabis at that, and paid a lot of money for it. So you know, I realized that we had to change the law in this country. 
to head yeah. Absolutely. I think we've all met that guy before. Anyway, um, uh, how do people, Mark, why don't you just say, uh, how do we get to you? You have a website. Give your website a little plug. Go ahead. My website, my web, my website is uh, uh, CannabisPatientNetwork.com. Yep. Uh, I actually have a YouTube channel that is CannabisPatientNetwork.org, though it's kind of, well, as you know, with a lot of issues we're dealing with YouTube right now, and they're one by one taking and doing away with my my uh, videos that I've had up there for the last uh, 17 years. And uh, so, uh, but uh, yeah, cannabis patient, uh, cannabis patient network.com. You can find a lot of my articles that I have on there and, and a few of my videos are, are available there too. There you go. And Hirsch, tell me about the Ananda strategy group in LA. Um, yeah, well, well, the, the website is um, anandastrategy.com, A-N-A-N-D-A strategy.com. And we work with um, brands and retailers and all kind of operators in the cannabis market and help them navigate the, the laws and regulations that exist. And there's way too many of them. Okay, Sean, talk about uh, Weed for Warriors project. Go ahead. You can reach us, go to wfwproject.org. There's email there. Just contact us. We'll get back. For those of you in California, we have SB34 events throughout the state. Look at our social media on our website. Instagram's our most active, WFW underscore project. And SB34 is where we give free cannabis away through the legal system. Amazing uh, events. And we're doing about, we're doing them eight this month. So uh, look for one in your area. There you go. Well, uh, I want to thank all you guys uh, for showing up short notice. And we pulled it off and you guys did a great job, Eric. Um, you can do this every day, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you did a hell of a job directing, and I believe we've live streamed. We've had great comments uh, from our group. And, and a reminder to please like, share, and subscribe to not only our uh, YouTube channel. And by the way, we're only 300 short of 15,000, and it's been kind of on hold for about six to eight weeks. I'd really like to see if we can get uh, enough people to subscribe to our YouTube channel to get us over that 15,000 hump, please, because I've been tired of rounding up all the time. Um, oh. and, and again, and then next week, the Cannabis Coast to Coast News Show will resume with our very talented Elena Pinto as the main anchor. So for Eric Williamson and everybody on the pro cannabis media side of things here, I am the founder. Jimmy Young, thank you so much for watching. Remember, it's a whole new world to meet out there, people. You can subscribe. We are Pro Cannabis Media. I think I messed up. Did you know there's a place that covers all the cannabis news you need? Welcome to Pro Cannabis Media, your go-to for all things cannabis. PCM is the CNBC of weed, bringing you the latest news and talk shows with a twist. We've got 16 state correspondents and multimedia journalists from around the U.S. and Canada. Hey everybody, it's Brandon Jones with Be Green Distribution with the Missouri Cannabis Report. I'm Karen Black from Greenfinger Consulting with the Arizona Cannabis Report. I'm Amy Carter from Michigan Weedsters. Andrew Berenger here reporting from Washington, D.C. i Debbie Fazy with the Canadian Talk of the Week. It all started back in 2018 when founder Jimmy Young kicked off the In the Weeds podcast. His mission? documenting the fight to end cannabis prohibition. Fast forward to today and we've got Cannabis Coast to Coast with Elena Pinto, delivering the nation's only TV-style cannabis news show. Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Cannabis Coast to Coast News, Pro Cannabis Media's weekly roundup of the news from the industry. I'm Elena Pinto. As of August 2024, PCM has racked up over 1.2 million views and 14.5 million impressions on our YouTube channel. With 15,000 subscribers and growing, our reach is spreading like wildfire. PCM's website, YouTube, Rumble, Discord, Roku, Twitch, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and even our very own PCM TV app. Get your cannabis news fix with Pro Cannabis Media. We're here to keep you informed and entertained. Stay tuned and stay lifted.